So we're continuing on here. I just wanted to back up real quick on the plasma protein concentration. Um, I mentioned to you it should be about 7 to 9 percent, and that is of the total plasma, just considering the liquid portion of your blood, 7 to 9 percent of that liquid portion of the blood should be um, plasma proteins, and you need them. Uh, the function is to provide colloid osmotic pressure. I wrote this down here because it's an important term that you should know. The colloid osmotic pressure is uh, provided from these particles that are too large to leave a capillary, and so they are providing an important um, function to pull these uh, water and these liquids that you've lost in a capillary bed, uh, you want to suck them back into the cardiovascular system um, at the end of a capillary bed, and for that you need some osmotic force, and the plasma proteins provide that force to sort of by osmosis suck the water back in. Now moving on to hemoglobin, you should know that's the protein that is in the red blood cells. Uh, red blood cells are filled up with hemoglobin. Uh, hemoglobin carries oxygen, and um, we'll take a look at that molecule in lecture a little bit more detail. Uh, bilirubin is a substance uh, that is generated when you're recycling the hemoglobin in the red blood cells. So when red blood cells are worn out or there's just some somehow defective, then uh, the uh, your body is trying to recycle as much as possible. But um, an important byproduct of the recycling of red blood cells is uh, bilirubin. The hematocrit is always expressed as percent. It's the percent solid in your blood. So percent solid. If you are taking your blood and you are putting it in a capillary or in a centrifuge tube and then you centrifuge it, then it will separate out into liquid and solid where the red blood cells are all the solid. The cells will settle down at the bottom and the um, liquid will be on top. And the hematocrit is the magic number in percent of solid. So um, a typical hematocrit should be around 45%. So that means 45% of your whole blood is solid cells and 55% is plasma, the liquid. A heparin is uh, a substance that prevents a clotting of blood. So um, heparin is uh, sometimes used in um, uh, it's, it's a um, coagulation inhibitor, and um, basically you can put it in a capillary uh, to prevent clotting if you're trying to measure hematocrit, or uh, heparin is also used in uh, sports creams um, to kind of dissolve clots or bruises that have formed. Anyway, so heparin is a coagulation inhibitor. Coagulation is a term that we use for clotting, not to be confused with agglutination, which is a clumping reaction due to an antibody antigen reaction. So coagulation is clotting of blood and agglutination is clumping of blood, which has different reasons. So coagulation, the clotting is a normal reaction when blood gets exposed to oxygen, for example, like in an injury. Uh, agglutination is an antibody antigen reaction and we're using that to uh, determine blood types. So um, the antigen is a any substance that produces an immune response. Now you would never attack yourself. So if you have the A antigen on your red blood cells, that means you would never make A antibodies because your body knows that A belongs to you and that antigen is normal. So if you were to uh, put your blood, mix it, your A blood that carries the A antigen, if you mix it with anti-A antibodies, then you would produce an agglutination reaction, a clumping reaction that's visible. And seem likewise, if you have the B antigen on your red blood cells and you were to mix your B blood with the anti-B antibodies, then you would produce a glutination reaction that you can visibly see. And there's a third antigen that we typically look for, that's the Rh factor, the rhesus factor. And um, the Rh factor is important because uh, it can cause problems um, with the Rh incompatibility um, with and during pregnancy. Let's say a woman is Rh negative, she doesn't have the Rh factor. That means if she would come in contact with Rh positive blood, as in her baby might have Rh positive blood, then her body would make antibodies against that foreign blood type. And um, it's usually not a problem the first pregnancy when that occurs, but um, 
in a subsequent pregnancy when the antibodies are already there and ready to go, then they cross the placenta and they would cause something known as erythroblastosis fetalis. And I'm just going to write that down. So the erythroblastosis fetalis, um, it's um, RH incompatibility between mother and baby. Why that particular antigen is such a problem when it's not uncommon that uh, babies have different blood types in their mothers. Um, there's still kind of some mystery around that. But anyway, take it for what it is, the RH factor. It's an important antigen, and it can cause problems as in if the mother develops antibodies against that. If it's foreign to her, if she doesn't have the RH factor, then she would make antibodies um, if she got exposed to this kind of blood, which could happen. You know, latest um, in her first pregnancy it will be exposure at the end, typically during birth, right around the time of birth. So it won't harm her first baby, but um, it will cause problems in subsequent pregnancies when she already has the antibodies and then they cross the placenta and as soon as the fetus makes its own blood then these antibodies would destroy the baby's blood and that's what is known as erythroblastosis fetalis not fatal it is fatal but uh, fetal is referring to the fetus here Okay, so blood typing is uh, something that you would have done in the lab um, Labster has a good exercise that also examines the RH incompatibility issue. It also is, uh, goes over the blood typing, and so you should definitely do a Labster exercise on this. It's quite good. It's the next best thing I can think of than to doing it actually yourself in a lab. It's a little unfortunate that you don't get to do this um, in person in the lab, but that's what it is right now. So blood typing, we're looking at the A and the B antigens, the presence or absence of it. Um, if you have neither A nor B antigen on your red blood cells, then your blood type O. If you have the A antigen, then your blood type A, and if you have the B antigen, then you have blood type B. And if you have both A and B antigens, then you would be blood type AB. And the RH, we just talked about it. It's another antigen that most people have. It's about 85% in the population have the RH antigen. Uh, you need to know blood type because um, in transfusions, if you have somebody a blood transfusion, the blood type has to match. Otherwise, you're going to have an agglutination reaction. That means this clumping reaction if you're giving somebody the wrong blood type. And uh, the blood would clump, agglutinate, and would clog up um, capillaries and even uh, to some extent larger blood vessels, and you, you would die almost immediately. It's um, basically you can't save, save a person's life if you give them the wrong blood type. That agglutinate a clumping reaction clump, clumps up the blood and um, you the blood would get stuck in capillaries and you would you would not make that you would not be able to survive that so it's important for transfusions to know somebody's blood type before you do a blood transfusion and um, this whole donor recipient compatibility comes in there you need to make sure that you give somebody the right blood type um, in general uh, blood types will be always matched to the people, but um, um, blood type O is basically known as the universal donor because they don't have any of these antigens, and so um, you can give blood type O at least theoretically to everybody. And now AB, blood type AB, they have both of these antigens, so they wouldn't be attacking either A or B or O blood, so they are the universal recipients. They could at least theoretically receive any blood type from anybody. Next, I'm going to go ahead and scroll through the lab until we hit the um, results pages and the data report pages and kind of um, give you some hints of what it should look like. So here you have your introduction. That's pretty much all the stuff that I was talking about just right now and with the important terms you can read up on that. Um, the blood lab have quite a few precautions as you might imagine. And here, uh, experiment A, the differential blood cell count. Uh, you have a very similar exercise on Labster. Please make sure that you're going to do that. Uh, take a look at the different um, white blood cells. Make sure that you can distinguish them. Um, you have the drawings that I did in the, on the front page. And um, this would be here your lab component to that. Uh, the part B, we would be doing a hematocrit determination. So I would have asked you to put a drop of blood into a capillary and then we centrifuge that and then you take the hematocrit. Remember, it would be the percent solid. So here, this would be this portion right here, the solid part. So here, we have 42%. And then the 
top portion, that's the liquid portion of the uh, blood, it's called the plasma. So if we express it in percent, your hematocrit, the textbook um, average is 45%. Uh, Here we have 42%, which is uh, absolutely normal. Um, okay, and then the uh, blood protein concentration, uh, we have a little device in the lab that measures that. Again, the blood protein is important for the colloid osmotic pressure. And then um, the second lab, still lab, that I put up for you is um, determination of the blood type and then the whole RH factor and RH incompatibility issues. So um, we take a look at that lab, still lab, it's quite good. Um, the hemoglobin concentration, we uh, used to do this with the Tarquist method, which is basically just putting a drop of blood onto a little piece of filter paper and examining the color and comparing it to a color chart, which is not very accurate and um, kind of silly. But we do have these little hemoglobin devices now in the lab. Uh, that measure very accurately your hemoglobin concentration and also give you a readout of the hematocrit, but um, unfortunately you don't get to do that. So here we have a bunch of notes, pages, and then here, just quickly going over the questions, uh, a hypothesis regarding male versus female RBC counts. Well, males do have a higher red blood cell count. They also have a higher hematocrit on average. Um, then a uh, hypothesis regarding male versus female white blood cell count. Well, white blood cells, they work for your immune system. They should not be any different, um, gender-based different. And then um, the hypothesis regarding male versus female hematocrit. Well, hematocrit and hemoglobin sort of go together. Um, males, again, are higher on average on the on the um, hematocrit and hemoglobin concentration, same thing. So males should have uh, a little bit higher hemoglobin concentration. And the reason for that is that males, on average, have a higher muscle mass and more muscle requires more oxygen, more hemoglobin is necessary. So here are some averages given um, the um, normal values. So for females, the red blood cell count per microliter of blood should be about 4 to 5 million. And for males, it should be on average a little bit higher, 4.7 to 6.1 million per microliter of blood. The white blood cell count should be uh, for both males and females somewhere between 5,000 to 10,000 cells per microliter of blood. Uh, you can draw your own individual granulocytes and egg granulocytes, so you can use either the book or the images that I put on the front page on the important uh, terms page. The percentages, um, up roughly what I put up there on the important terms page, and you can read up on that here too. Uh, the hematocrit, um, the normal range here for women, women average is 42% with a range of 37 to 47% solid in the blood and men the average is 46 percent so a little higher with a range of about 40 to 54 percent uh, plasma protein concentration i told you up in the in the front page uh, seven to nine grams per deciliter so percent by volume then um that here the normal values are given slightly off from that 6.3 to 8.3 grams per deciliter uh, that's um the normal right here and then your results from the blood typing uh, here is um, also the um, you can draw that in and then some sort of population comparison or averages here given um, the majority of people in the United States have blood type O and then followed by blood type A and then B is relatively rare and then AB is uh, the least common blood type and the RH uh, factor is about 85% of the po population, with RH negative being about 15% of the population. And then there you can put your hemoglobin measurements. We're supposed to go there. Class data table, which obviously we're not going to do. And then here, just let's answer some of these questions. So obviously, question 5, 6, 7 we can't do because we don't have the data table. Um, briefly here on eight, the right gemes are stained. That's the um, sequence of a fixative, the eosin and the um, purple dye, so the basic dye. And it's it, it enables you to distinguish those two white blood cells that are hard to distinguish. They look very much alike, the eosinophil and the basophil. And it enables you to distinguish them by the staining properties of their granules. And I'm going to start next, another section.